Good afternoon and welcome to the Bay Area UFO Expo. The Bay Area UFO Expo is the best expo regarding UFOs, extraterrestrials, Area 51, and conspiracies. And today we have an absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary guest, of course. We have Mr. Jordan Maxwell. Give him a big hand. And uh, to talk about to talk about conspiracies, to talk about truth, the dissemination of truth, the myths and misconceptions, and to give Jordan a real great introduction and everything, please give a very warm and wonderful welcome for Mr. John Rhodes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been my greatest honor in my life to actually be able to call Jordan Maxwell a good friend. More than that, it's one of my greatest honors to also call him my teacher. For without Jordan Maxwell, for myself as for many people here, we wouldn't have gained the knowledge that we would have to this point without his words of his wisdom that have trickled from his lips over the years. Jordan's been active in this community since 1959. This is longer than probably anybody I know that's currently active in the UFO or paranormal or symbolic um, schooling that we are going through in these modern times. This means that this man has actually outlasted many people who have long since disappeared from the scene because they didn't have the fortitude or the hope for mankind that Jordan has. Jordan is the capstone. He is definitely the lighthouse by which we travel upon the shores and the seas of life, making our way from one place to another. Put your hands together for Jordan. More than that, we have to understand that he provides us wisdom. Wisdom has always been associated with a snake, of course, or a serpent. And I'm, Jordan, I'm not calling you a serpent, although I think that would have, I think in many ways that would be a, a great tribute to you. But also please understand that the water of life in this world is wisdom. Because we don't learn to swim, we drown in our own ignorance. And in tribute to uh, Jordan this afternoon, before I introduce him, I'd like to give a little bit of a symbolic breakdown of my own, of who Jordan is. Because Jordan and I have had conversations in which we wonder if things are really predestined. We see signs and paths along the road in hindsight, and we understand how they have actually attributed to our lives in many ways and have guided us without us even knowing it. It's almost as if we wonder where is free will. Take Jordan Maxwell, for example. The water of life. Jordan, of course, is a river. And it provided the water of life for many people over in the Middle East. It's a very sacred river, a very honored river. And of course, Maxwell, means maximum and well. Well contains the water of life within the arid deserts of humanity. So therefore, Jordan Maxwell means the deepest well of wisdom. And today, he is going to allow us to drink from that cup which he provides us. Ladies and gentlemen, it has often been said that the men of great renown were themselves the sons of God. And as he will so gladly point out, many of them have dualistic attributes of their own. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you the pleasure this afternoon of meeting one of the great sons of God. And like the sons of God are known throughout ancient met metaphysical histories of producers of thunder from the heavens, please put your hands together for a thunderous applause for Mr. Jordan Maxwell. I said, nobody's that good, but he convinced me. <laughs> and applause does not impress me because Abraham Lincoln got a standing ovation the night they shot him. So anyway, 
Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here with me. I want to preface my comments by saying, as I always do, because it's important to me, I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I never will be. I know how much I don't know. I prefer to think of myself as an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. I believe that within each one of us is the ability to pursue spiritual high places within each one of us. Unfortunately, we've had that drummed out of us by our masters who perceive that they are uh, the masters of our destiny. But I believe that the earth was created by a higher form of life than that which, pres uh, which presents itself to lead us today. We're not being, we don't have political leaders. We have misleaders. And consequently, we cannot depend on other men. When the Bible expressly says, put not your trust in earthly man in whom there is no salvation. So anytime you start thinking in terms of government as is there to help you and to take care of you, you better do your homework and find out that's only there for one reason, to control you for your masters. We are in the living Right now, I believe, <clears throat> in Berlin, 1939-40. As far as I'm concerned, we need to begin to wake up and find out what freedom is all about and start asking some very serious questions about who is leading us and where are they taking the human family. We are in serious trouble on this earth, and the people who are guiding the destiny of this world are profoundly evil. Their agenda is so profoundly evil, most men are not even able to perceive it. But go back into history a little bit, into 1944, 1945, and look at the concentration camps. Look at the total devastation of human liberty and freedom foisted on the people of Germany and the rest of Europe, but ultimately on the whole world. And you will begin to realize what's coming for America. We are truly living in the last days. I, there is no doubt in my mind about that. But the last days of what? So many times people are misunderstanding those terms in the Bible. I totally believe we are living in the last times, the last days of an old era, of an old dispensation. And we are very quickly arriving at a place where we're going to confront our God. We're going to confront those who have created us. I believe that we are on the precipice of a whole new civilization which is coming on the earth. And I think that this civilization is going to be the most diabolical, the most terrible thing that's ever happened on the earth. And unless we humans get back to our own spirituality and start thinking in terms of being in contact with our divine essence in space, with our divine presence in space. Uh, men have called God, but unless we get back in tune with the universe and start appreciating freedom and respect for other people, and I'm not the glowing example of any of this. I'm equally as guilty as everyone else is of forgetting these principles. But I feel that I can best... Uh, pronounce these principles because I have so fallen short myself. But ultimately, there will come a day when we're going to have to realize we are not alone in this universe. And whoever it was that created us, and the mere fact that we are, we are created implies a creator. And whoever it was that created us, I am sure they're watching us. It is my personal opinion that we are not only being visited by extraterrestrial life forms, but they are in fact leading the world. I think that we are being led by other world intelligences right now. And I think that there's going to come a time when whoever created us is going to deal with this hidden agenda. So I think we are all on the cutting edge of something brand new that's coming on the earth. Human freedom is going to rise again because the creators that created us designed us to live free. I've talked with my friend Zachariah Sitchin for many years about these subjects and many other writers, 
And which brings me to uh, belatedly thank my friend Richard and also uh, John for all the things that you have said, and I appreciate them. Um, I think that we are all coming to a place where we're going to be confronted by the fact that we are, we are actually being led by extraterrestrial intelligences. I think the governments know that. I think the religious leaders of the world know that. And I think we're going to be forced to see it soon. So I don't, I don't believe in accidents. I think we're here for a reason. I, and I am sure that nobody is here that wasn't supposed to be. And those who are not here were not supposed to be. I don't believe in accidents. The subject is, uh, what did I do? Okay. The subject is uh, the sons of God. There you go. The subject is sons of God. And all of the ancient scriptures of the world, there are stories replete in all ancient scriptures about the fact that there was something called the sons of God uh, or alien life forms who have come here from other worlds who uh, mingled with us. This is replete in Buddhist literature, Hindu, uh, Zoroastrian literature, Christian, Judaism, Islam. Many of the ancient faiths of the world all talk about the fact that there are so-called angels or entities or demons or whatever you want to call them. But the Bible in particular talks about, and I have a high respect for the Bible. I do not believe it is the word of the almighty true God because I do not believe the Hebrews were monotheistic. Let me clarify that for you right off the bat. The Hebrews were not a monotheistic people. Monotheistic simply means mono, means one, or the worship of one God, monotheistic. But in point of fact, Hebrews were not monotheistic. They were he no, H-E-N-O, henotheistic. Henotheistic in the dictionary simply means choosing one God from a, from a series of equals. So there were a series of gods, all equal, and the Hebrews, according to the ancient tradition, picked one of the group to worship. So they were henotheistic, not mono. It doesn't mean that there was only one god. It means that they only picked one god from a series of gods. We see that in the Bible. Now, when I use the Bible, I prefer it. I've got about 30 different translations. But I prefer the Companion Bible. The Companion Bible is the best, I believe, because it not only gives you the scriptures, but it gives you footnotes which are not normally talked about in any religious organization. they got some really off-the-wall footnotes in this Bible. I mean, strange stuff. And that's what I'm into, strange stuff. Now, <laughs> let's see. Where do we start? Uh, Genesis 1. All right, first of all, we go back and we say, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Those are the two major texts we'll be talking about. But, and, say it again. Oh, yeah. Can we focus it? Say it again. I don't have any problem. I can see it pretty good here. <laughs> oh, whatever. Okay. Anyway, this is the chief text from which I'm taking this uh, whole subject. It's from Genesis 1, uh, 1 and 2. Again, the Hebrews are not monotheistic. They're henotheistic. A classic example of this is in the book of Psalms 82. Has it gotten any clearer? Okay. Psalms 82 uh, has a very interesting scripture in the book, in the Old Testament book of Psalms. It says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. The footnotes right across says, God, in Hebrew, Elohim, but the appendage of, of number four 
means that he standeth officially in the congregation of the mighty equals to the gods, G-O-D-S, in capital letters. The word God is Elohim. So again, we go back to the idea that God is standing officially, representing himself, the God of the Hebrews, in a congregation of the mighty, more than one God. And the gods collectively said in Genesis 1.26, Genesis 1.26 has an interesting scripture that's been talked about for many years among Christians and Jews. Uh, people have never understood the implications of this scripture. It's Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Rabbi Marvin Antelman, many years ago, back in 19, the mid-1960s, I used to be in constant communication and carrying on conversations with a rabbi who I am assuming is no longer with us. This was many years ago. He was the head of an American rabbinical association in Newton, Massachusetts. And we used to talk about such things as arcane scriptures and what they really meant. This is back in 65, 66. And Rabbi Entelman pointed out to me that uh, we are misreading this scripture. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say that God created man. It doesn't say that. There's no place in the Bible that actually says in the Old Testament that God created man. He said, go back and read the scripture, 126, and do, break it down and, as you would in any English uh, uh, configuration of a sentence. And what is being said here is not being said. What's not being said, first of all, is that God is creating a new creature called man. No. What is being said is that God said, God, again being Elohim in the plural, the gods are saying, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. What's being said is that someone has come here who we are referred to as the Elohim in Hebrew, the gods, and they are saying, upon looking at the indigenous creatures that we call today hominids, they're saying, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not, you know, because being so great, he's not that great. Neanderthal man was wonderful, but he's not that great. So come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And so obviously there was some kind of a genetic experiment with the first couples, the first uh, human creatures on the earth. <clears throat> And that, uh, come let us make man in our image and likeness, the footnote says image means likeness, in the likeness of our image, Elohim, the gods. In any case, the image and likeness is physical, not moral, but some physical likeness to the Elohim still exists. So what we're seeing here is the Bible is talking about Elohim, the gods, who created us, look like us, or Actually, we look like them. And we've been told by so many people who have claimed to have been abducted that the abductors, the extraterrestrial abductors, look like humans. I'm thinking, well, go back and look at this in the Bible. They said they look like us. Uh, here in the final judgment of God, we see Adam and Eve, and we see God uh, portrayed as he is always, the God, the creator, is always portrayed as a man. Here in Genesis 3:22 we read, And the Lord God said, Behold, a man is become as one of us, knowing good and evil. Now the gods are talking to each other after they've created this new creation, uh, taken the Neanderthal or the ancient hominids and procreated with them, with the females, and created a new race, that's us. And here man has become as one of us. Now, he looks more like us, he's thinking like us. And here in Genesis uh, 11, 1, is it possible for us to close that door? Because we're hearing a lot of uh, excess. I don't know if it's going to, yeah, it's probably even worse behind us. <laughs> anyway, and the Lord God said, Behold, that man has become as one of us. Then we go to chapter 11, 
where we have another um, we have another story in chapter 11 where Sodom and Gomorrah is so evil that God hears about the the terrible um, lifestyles of the people, how bad they are in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God said, or the gods said, let's preface this uh, comment by the gods, it says, and the Lord said, behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So go to, let us go down and see what mankind is doing. So it's as if these gods who created us are saying, my goodness, look what we have created. We've created this creature that is now out of control. It's smart, it's clever, it's wise, it's doing all kinds of off-the-wall things. Let us go down and see what they're doing. Let us go down. Now, where was the creature Adam? Uh, many of us have heard the story in the Bible that Adam was created by God, Adam and Eve. My question is, where was the creature Adam or man formed? In the first book of the Old Testament Bible, does it not say that God created man in the Garden of Eden? No, it doesn't say that at all. The Bible doesn't say God created man in the Garden of Eden. It says in Genesis 2, 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. It didn't say he formed him there. That's where he put the result of the experiment into a place that the ancient people called the Garden of Eden. Later on, we begin to see that this Garden of Eden is talked about in all of the ancient scriptures, not as a garden uh, as we would perceive it, but it was a protected area, uh, an area which was cordoned off by the gods so that the, uh, the other remaining ancient um, hominid creatures, the Neanderthal or whatever they were, hominid creatures could not get into that area where the experiment was going on by the crossbreeding of animal of, with uh, humans and, uh, and the gods. So they had a protected area where they were working this experiment. It was called the Garden of Eden. And so here we find that the Lord God planted a garden or a protected area in the place called Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. It's interesting, the word formed as a potter. The footnote says formed as a potter. Interesting. Here again in Isaiah 64, the prophet Isaiah talks about, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we are the works of thy hand. Again, the Bible and the Hebrew tradition is, is um, giving us the idea that we are molded or like a potter deals with uh, creating a new creature or a new uh, creation. So God is presented to us as the potter. Uh, and co of course, in many Bibles and many Christian publications, we see God makes man, a statue of God imaging man. Man and God look the same. They look like humans. And it shows how God made Adam in his own image, just like a potter. And, of course, we know in the ancient uh, Egyptian, the Egyptian god uh, was known as the potter, the potter of man. This is where the Hebrews got the concept of God being the potter, the designer of the human creature. I believe that there is something to this uh, whole idea that we are actually an experiment or a creation of a higher life form that we call in Hebrew the Elohim or the gods. Speaking of the creation of man, the Quran even says, in the Holy Quran, makes a statement that says, We created you, O mankind. Again, not I, not the Lord, but we. We created you in the Quran. In the Bible book of Genesis, in Genesis, there is a story about the flood of Noah's day in which God speaks seeks to wipe out all of mankind by a great deluge. We've all heard of the Noatian flood or the flood of Noah's day. 
And after the flood is over, Noah, his wife, and three sons, and their three wives, only eight people are left alive on the earth. Now we're picturing this as the after the flood is over, all of mankind has been destroyed, according to the Bible story, and the, the, ark, of the, the ark of Noah finally settles somewhere around, we're told, Mount Ararat, which incidentally the word Ararat simply means high mountain. It doesn't mean the particular Ararat in, in, uh, in the Middle East that means a high mountain, so it could have come down anywhere. But most people who are looking for the lost ark don't know that. They've never done their homework, so they don't know that the word Ararat simply means high mountain. Anyway, so the picture in the Bible is that the flood of Noah's day is over. The people are all uh, drowned except for eight people on the, on the ark. And then in Genesis 9-1 is an interesting scripture where God is saying, the gods who created mankind and brought this eight people through the great deluge, and it says, And God blessed Noah and his son and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. What are you talking about replenish the earth? Well, obviously, if there were people on the earth and God decided to destroy them, and if we're going to have people on the earth again, well, then you have to re. That's very simple. Re means do again. So, uh, knowing his sons and daughters are told to replenish the earth. Do it again. So, we have Adam and Eve being created by God. Um, after the flood, Noah's being told to replenish the earth. But now, back in Genesis 1, when God is creating the first human pair, we're told in Adam and Eve, the first human pair, God says, to, God says the same thing to them. And a lot of people don't know this, but in Genesis 1, 28, it says about Adam and Eve, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Do it again. And I called Dr., uh, the rabbi, and we talked for about an hour or two on this one subject, and I had my first question to him, this is back in the 1960s, I asked him, is this a correct translation of the original Phoenician or Hebrew language, the word replenish? And he said that's an absolutely correct uh, interpretation. Yes, it means do it again. And I said, whoa, what are you talking about? Adam and Eve's not the first human couple, but they are, they're being told to repopulate the earth again. And he brought to my attention something called in Hebrew, tohohu bohu. In order to understand Genesis 1.28, where Adam and Eve are told to replenish the earth, do it again, we have to first look at Genesis 1.2, in which we find in a strange and interesting Hebrew term, and I'm not a Hebrew, so I'm not maybe saying this correctly, tohu va bohu. This particular word is only used twice in the Bible both in the Old Testament. The first time we read tohu vavohu is in Genesis 1-2. The second time is in the book of Jeremiah. We'll get to that. Let's go back to Genesis 1 where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we see that the word God, I think we've got that, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But then in Genesis 1, 2, the second scripture says, And the earth was without form and void. Well, logic alone would tell you that there's something wrong here. God doesn't create something that has no form, and it's a void at its creation. So there must be a, a mistranslation. Well, of course, the people who translated the uh, King James Bible uh, were great on the King's English, but they weren't that hot on Hebrew. And so consequently, they made a few mistakes, 5,286, I think it was, of just typographical error. So, you know, because being in the King's English back in the Middle Ages when this was uh, being, um, you know, prepared, the, the King James authorized version, as I said, they made a few mistakes because they didn't understand as much about Hebrew even as we do today. 
And that's another interesting story about why did they call the King James Bible the authorized version? It's because King James authorized his people to read only that version. And you'd better not be caught reading any other version. It's the authorized one. Period. You got a problem with that? <laughs> we catch you reading something we didn't authorize you to read. And so consequently, I think there's a lot to be said about the authorized version. Anyway. And the earth was without form and void, as more correctly understood. And the footnotes, they clarify it. And the earth was without form and void, or translated, was without form and void in Hebrew is tohu va bohu, bohu, which means became a waste and a desolation. And in the footnote below, you will see that was actually means became. And without form actually is interpreted in the footnote as a waste and a void. Not created tohu, but became tohu, meaning that the earth became a waste and a desolation. So God created the earth and then it became a waste and a desolation. It wasn't created that way. It sounds like what we're getting ready to do with the earth today. It was a beautiful place until it became a waste and a desolation by our masters who seek to destroy all things that are beautiful on the earth with bombs. I cannot imagine the insanity of a human creature who would go out to a South Sea island in the Pacific called Bikini, one of the most uh, desolate, beautiful, paradise islands in the South Pacific, and there set up a damn atomic bomb. What kind of lunacy rules these maniacs in government? I don't believe they're human. I don't think they're from here. I think they have another agenda, and I think I know who they are. Again, tohu va bohu simply be, means to, it became a waste and a desolation. The earth was beautiful, and then it became a waste. This word is only found in the Bible twice, once in Genesis 1-2 and the second time in Genesis 4-23. In, Gen in Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 4-23. In the book of Jeremiah 4-23, we are told that Jeremiah is given a vision by God of the world that was before man was created. In the Bible, he says in Jeremiah 4-23, and I beheld the earth, this is in a vision, he says. In his vision, or in his dream, he says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Again, tohu va bohu. No, that's not what it means. And lo, and beheld, lo, there was no man. So it's what Jeremiah is saying, once you understand the correct interpretation of that word tohu vahu, is that Jeremiah is saying, I beheld the earth when there was no man, and it was a beautiful paradise, and then it became a waste and a desolation. Well, that makes sense that Adam and Eve would then be a recreation and be told to do it again, implying that the earth has had many ancient civilizations that have been destroyed, maybe by atomic warfare, maybe by... Uh, other world uh, technology that has destroyed life on the earth. And we very well, as I said before, might be heading in that direction again, a confrontation with the gods. I should not be a bit surprised if we're going to wake up soon and find out what we have done to the earth is now going to be paid back and is going to come from those who have created us. They're coming back. Again, back to Jeremiah 4.23, it says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down, and the whole land shall become desolate. So there were cities, but now they're gone. They're desolate. 
And this, of course, as I said, was in a vision before mankind was even on the earth. And um, I, have a tr I have a Bible translation called 26 Translations. It gives you all 26 translations in one Bible. Makes it easier for uh, research. And on that, um, Jeremiah 4, 23, 24, etc., uh, I go to that Bible and get the different translations views. And they're all basically saying that uh, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void and the heavens had no light. And it goes on to tell you like uh, I beheld the mountains and they were trembling and the hills were in commotion, implying a great earthquake. I saw the fertile field was now a waste and I beheld the, gr the garden like uh, was, was now a desert and all the cities had been broken down. The bottom line is that in the book of Jeremiah, it's saying in a vision, Jeremiah saw the earth when it was beautiful, but there, were no man, there was no man here, and then something terrible happened and destroyed the great cities. We've heard this motif many times in different ways. We've heard it in Genesis flood, when the flood of Noah's day, as I said, and we're all f pretty much familiar with that. But then there's another scripture in Genesis 6, one that says, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of water upon the earth. This is then Genesis 6 when God is going to bring the flood. Where in the breath of life from under the heavens and everything in it on the earth shall die. So we've, we're, we've been told about this great destruction. Well, I am of the opinion, and, and I think science is also, science has proven that there was never could not ever be a total world flood in which the entire earth was covered with water. That is, in point of fact, a scientific impossibility that has never and could never happen. However, we have had devastating earthquakes. We have had huge and destructive forces at work where whole nations have been crippled and whole cities have been wiped out by earthquakes or volcanoes or tsunami waves in Japan. So I think that this is what's being said, that there was a time when a great destruction came on the civilizations that were there. They weren't probably all over the earth, but wherever they were, something happened. Well, this is very reminiscent, of course, of Atlantis because we're told that Atlantis was a very beautiful place and one day they woke up and found it as a waste and a desolation. It just don't exist anymore. Well, go back to the Bible. Remembering Atlantis was supposedly destroyed in one day and one night. That implies if it was an island and most likely it was a diffusion of islands, it wasn't just one island. It was like perhaps a um, Australia that have other islands like uh, New Zealand and other islands around it. Most usually large islands have other diffusions of smaller ones around. And so I'm assuming that that probably was what was the case with Atlantis. But that the fact that Atlantis went under in one day and one night, as Plato said, how could one enormous uh, uh, island, say, the size of Australia, go under and be destroyed in one day and one night, never to be seen again. That's like saying that Australia, and within 24 hours, no longer exists on the face of the earth. Well, you have to imagine that if something like that were to occur, two things are obvious. One is that the tsunami waves would cover the earth. The earth itself would feel the repercussions of such a tremendous uh, feat of destruction in one place. The waves would be tremendous. Earthquakes would be tremendous around the world. It would disrupt the entire harmonics of the earth to have that much land destroyed in one day. Consequently, how would Atlantis or an Australia or any other large island how is it possible that they could be destroyed in 24 hours and never seen again? The only way that is possible is for some kind of an earth movement beneath the continent, some sort of an earthquake fault. And this is exactly what the Bible says happened at the time of the great flood. At the time of the flood in Genesis 7, it says, 
In the sixth day, in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the foundations or fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heavens were open, and the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. We all know about the 40 days and 40 nights of the rain of the days of Noah. But go back and look at this. It says, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. The fountains of the great deep and, and the ancient Hebrew understanding and then the conversations I've had with the rabbis are saying basically what is being said there is that there was a huge earthquake fault under, uh, under the Atlantic in which one day and one night that thing broke. And when it broke, the entire superstructure of Atlantis went under. We know that that is possible. We know that that is at least scientifically possible for a great island like Japan or any other great island of the sea. If the earthquake is sufficient, it would take under the entire country in one foul swoop. It's at least possible. Therefore, in my opinion, Atlantis is at least possible. Now, we move on from that. <clears throat> what does the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Atlantic Fracture Zone look like? Actual scientists have, have photographed the Atlantic Ridge where basically uh, Atlantis would have existed. And we're finding that there is, in point of fact, a huge earthquake fault under the Atlantic Ocean. Who knows what maybe that fault covers up? Perhaps there was something on top that now was sucked down into in a great catastrophe and that fault closed over it. We know that we're finding stuff on the Atlantic floor which indicates that there are life forms who have been here and have been in the Atlantic. Again, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Well, there's an earthquake fault in the Atlantic. <clears throat> now, could there, could there have been an actual Atlantis? My personal opinion, with, uh, with only the proof that is uh, available, my personal opinion is yes. There's no doubt in my mind that Atlantis existed. Now, how it existed, and it's, um, it's a general uh, description of Atlantis, I don't think any of us know, but I think it existed. I know something existed. I can prove that. We now know that there are ancient temples found under the oceans and all around the world. This is scientific photographic fact. We know that there are temples and huge, enormous uh, uh, temple layouts of roads under the sea. And here are stones on the Atlantic floor perfectly laid square stones on the Atlantic floor, which, it, uh, which in nature does not ever appear. Nothing perfect in design appears in nature. But there are square stones laid out on the floor of the Atlantic. Again, you'll see the, uh, this is off the coast of Japan, I think. <clears throat> Great temples have been found off of Okinawa and the ocean. Uh, incidentally, I don't know if you know this or not, but Albert Einstein, I don't know if you can believe him, but he said that um, he believed that the Bermuda Triangle was a vortex for alien life forms to come through into our, into our space on Earth. And he believed it was a vortex. Uh, he mentioned that in his writings. I started thinking, well, wait a minute. I've heard other scientists talk about vortexes through the earth. I know about geomancy or the science of ley lines. And, uh, and then I read a book where it said if you take the globe, the, the, the earth, and you draw on the globe the Bermuda Triangle and go straight through the earth to the other side, it comes out in something called the Devil's Triangle off the coast south of the coast of Japan near what is called the Mar Mariana Trench. One of the deepest uh, spots on the oceans of the world today is the Mariana Trench. 
uh, seven and a half to eight miles straight down of water. But I thought, wait a minute, if the Bermuda Triangle, that triangle were to go through the earth, yes, it is true. Charles Bolletz even wrote a book about the Devil's Triangle off the coast of Japan, which is identical to the Bermuda Triangle uh, off the coast of Florida. And then you begin to see from different books and research books about UFOs coming out of the Devil's Triangle. Uh, Japanese airline pilots during the war, commercial airline pilots from Japan, Korea, and uh, that whole part of Asia have many reports of seeing UFOs come out of, uh, of that area and go back in many times. So maybe uh, Einstein was right. Maybe there is some kind of a vortex going on right now in front of us, and we are too ignorant to even suspect it. Again, uh, actually some of the scientists have theorized that it was the flow of, uh, and this is just, uh, uh, to me is amazing, that there are actually people who uh, are theorizing <clears throat> that these great walls were made by, by the flow of currents changing. The currents changed and caused this. Uh, and, and I was amazed to hear this on television, on, on things like the Discovery Channel. You have uh, uh, people who are paid lackeys of the system, the paid lackeys who get their paycheck from the universities to go out and tell all the poor, ignorant masses of the world, all the going of the world, the poor, ignorant, ill-informed, unread masses, tell them anything. They'll believe it. They're so stupid. So tell them something, and they'll love it. <clears throat> and if you've got a Ph.D. by your name, uh, then they'll believe it. And tell them it's just the, uh, the, the currents did that, and they'll believe it. Well, unfortunately, uh, I, you know, like Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool some of the people some of the time, and you can fool all the people some of the time, but you can't fool everybody all the time. No current in the world makes clean, crisp uh, structures like this under the ocean under the ocean. <clears throat> I'm totally convinced that there's something else going on here on the earth and we haven't been told the whole story. While we're on the subject of temples under the ocean, another scripture comes to mind. This one's truly off the wall, if it's the one I'm thinking of. Um, while we're on the subject of temples, under the oceans, two other scriptures come to mind. In the Christian scriptures, in the New Testament, Mark 5, 1 through 15, and in Hebrew, uh, Old Testament, Job 26.5. Now, Job 26.5 is truly a remarkable, strange scripture. But let's, uh, let's start with, uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, we start with 5. Mark 5, this is New Testament theology. And in the New Testament, we're told about uh, Jesus comes upon a crazy man and the tombs that cannot be tied down. He breaks the chains. He's crazy. He's totally out of his mind. And he's demonic. He has a demon. And it says that Jesus approached this man and, and uh, said, uh, Who are you? And the, and the voice inside the man, the demon, said, We are a legion. Well, of course, a legion was like 10,000 in Latin terms, uh, in the Latin military a legion, I believe, was 10,000 men. So what was being said is that the spirit entity inside the man said there's 10,000 of, 10, of us demons inside this man. Anyway, and all the devils besought Jesus, saying, send us into the swine, because Jesus was going to order, the scripture says Jesus was going to order the demons to come out of the man. And they said, don't do that. Don't take us out of this man. And when it was apparent he was going to anyway, <clears throat> then they said, All the devils besought Jesus, saying, Send us into the swine, or into pigs, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits came out of the man and entered into the pigs, or the swine. And the herds ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000. They were choked in the sea. I remember many years ago a philosopher talking about this. Why would, the, why would these swine or pigs run into the sea? 
when they were filled with demonic uh, spirits. Is there something going on in the sea that they were using these animals? Uh, they have to, they were disembodied spirits. They have to be inside of a body until they can get to water because your body is over 90% water. And if they can exist inside of your, your battery, inside of your um, body, which is, as I said, is over 90% water, is there something going on that these spirit entities need to get back into water? Just a thought. But from there, we go to Job 26, because I had remembered the scripture in Job 26, 5, that says dead things. This is the Old Testament. Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. I think I might have. Well, I think if you can see the footnote that said dead things are formed from under the waters. Uh, the place where the repium stay. This is a, a word in the Hebrew, repium, which simply means the demonic creatures that live in the oceans of the world. Not great fish. Repium simply means great demonic uh, creatures who, who inhabit the oceans. The place where the Rephaim stay, which is beneath the waters and the things that are therein. The word dead things in the scripture is a Hebrew word for the Rephaim, the offspring of fallen angels, which are akin to the Nephilim. So there seems to be, as Zechariah and I talked about this, uh, there seems to be something to this, because he talks about in his books the Anunnaki. Uh, the, uh, of course, the Nephilim, the Nephilim, those who have uh, from heaven come down. Now, I want to go back over this and just read it. Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Job 26, Old Testament. And it says in the footnote, dead things are formed from under the waters, the place where the Rephaim stay, which is beneath the waters and the things that are therein. The word dead things, a Hebrew word, which means rephium, the offspring of fallen angels, which are akin to the Nephilim. They are formed, which means in Hebrew, they remain to this day. So the Bible is actually saying, even according to the Hebrew Tograms, which is the old rabbinical works on uh, commentaries on the scriptures, seem to indicate that the ancient uh, rabbis believed that there were entities who lived in the ocean. They were other world entities who have come here from another place, like the Anunnaki that Zachariah Sitchin talks about. But that these uh, particular creatures hide themselves in the seas of the world, in the oceans. All of this goes back to Atlantis. All of this implies that there were ancient civilizations under the oceans. We know that's true because we're seeing these temples under the oceans of the world. And all I'm implying is that there very well might be something to this, that there were ancient prehistoric civilizations of alien life forms who have come here from other worlds hundreds of thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago, and were destroyed through great floods, through great uh, um, shifts in the earth crust. I'm saying there's at least a possibility there might be something to all of this. And the implication is quite simple. If I am right, and if there is a modicum of truth in this, they may still be out there today. We may still be dealing with the Rephaim, the Nephilim, or those in the ancient Hebrew tradition, the gods who came here from another time and another place. The word, incidentally, I don't know if you know this, but when you read in the scriptures, about how the demons are cast into the abyss or the devil comes out of the abyss or whatever. There's all many different scriptures in the Bible talking about the demons who live in the abyss or who come out of the abyss or demons that are cast into the abyss. The abyss means water. So when you hear about uh, the demons cast into the abyss, it means aqua. It means water. And actually, there was a motion picture made not too long ago called The Abyss. And in that movie, The Abyss, was about under the oceans, ultimately the divers and this diving uh, submarine 
uh, are they hit something and their life is now in danger. They can't come up and they're going to die. And all of a sudden, en entities from another world, entities, come to save them. And instead of bringing them to the surface, they take them deeper down into a city at the bottoms of the ocean. Well, even uh, George Lucas uh, with his um, Star Wars has uh, that silly looking creature running around with the long ears and it dives into the ocean, remember, and everyone dives with him. And they go down into this underwater city. Uh, there are many, many different uh, movies that have been made about underwater cities that uh, are created by the Nephilim or gods from another world. I'm just saying there's too much smoke not to be a fire. I'm suspecting there may be something to all of this. Um, incidentally, in relation to all of this, and the bottom line of what I'm presenting is quite simply, I think that there is something to the idea that we are the creation of a higher civilization which have created us, they are watching us, they are monitoring us, I think that this is what the uh, alien abductions might be all about. They are monitoring their uh, creation. They're watching us. They're checking our, our interior of our bodies to see if we've evolved or if we're in some way mutating. And so I believe there's something to this going on. I think we're being watched by our masters. Now, but in Genesis 4, there's an interesting story that's caused a lot of of discussion too about uh, Adam and Eve have uh, two sons, uh, Cain and Abel. And we're told that Cain uh, kills his brother, Abel. In chapter 4, it goes on to say, And Cain talked with his brother, Abel, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The story in the Bible, many of you know, is that how Cain and Abel were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. So we got four people in the garden or in this particular area. We have the first male and female, Adam and Eve, who are told to redo the earth again, replenish it. And so the first, uh, the first try at replenishing the earth, they have two sons, Cain and Abel. But then Cain, typical of humans, kills his brother. Now he's got problems. Cain has to deal with the Creator who didn't give him permission to go kill his brother. And so when God or the gods uh, discover that Cain has killed his brother, we're talking about now only three people on the earth, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain kills Abel. Now we've got Adam and Eve and Cain. But then in the Scripture, uh, on, um, after that, we are told in Genesis 4 that when God finds out that Cain has killed his brother, interesting scripture here, I think. It says in Genesis 4.13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said, <clears throat> Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, <clears throat> vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from that presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. The point I'm making here is that Cain is afraid to be sent out of the garden or the protected area because he says that everyone out there that will find me will kill me. He thinks there's somebody out there. I mean, God said there's Adam and Eve and, this, and the first couple, and Cain has said, no, no, don't send me out there because they're going to get me if I go out there. Now he actually has God believing there's somebody out there. <clears throat> Because God said, okay, I'll put a mark on you so that anyone out there finding you won't kill you. What are you talking about? People outside the garden? Yes. Hundreds of thousands of people. Maybe millions of people. This was an experiment. And when I say people, I'm talking about the ancient hominids, the Neanderthal creatures, 
the the ones that we know of that are referred to in science as a hominid creatures. They travel in huge uh, families, hundreds of them in, a, in any family. And of course, of course, in my mind, it's like Cain is saying, don't send me into the prison. Don't send me out there with all the grown men, just a teenager, you know. I'm a sitting duck. Don't send me out there. I'm going to be, I'll be killed. And so God says, no, I know. You've got a problem. I'll take care of it and put a, a mark on you so they won't harm you. The implication is overwhelming that even the Bible infers that before Adam and Eve, there are other creatures already on the earth, other humans on the earth. <clears throat> Here Cain does not, and as I said, I, I just made the point, God tells him, no, he's not going to allow anybody to hurt him. Where were these people that Cain was concerned about? The question is, who are these people that Cain uh, ultimately goes out into a place called Nod? And uh, that's not the place where Art Bell does his radio show, but this is in the Bible. And in the land of Nod, we find hominids, hominid creatures, pre-Adamic man. All you have to do is go on the web or go to the library and just look up the word pre-Adamic man, before Adam. Pre-Adamic man, there are tons of reference works on the ancient and prehistoric civilizations of humans that from Atlantis all the way back to Mu, uh, Lemuria, back into the most pre-history uh, of the human race. Probably hundreds of thousands and if Michael Cremo is right, billions of years ago. Michael Cremo is an extraordinary, with his friend, uh, extraordinary researchers into the ancient past of the human family on Earth. And Michael Cremo's work is voluminous work. And it is astoundingly brilliantly presented, showing that the human race has been on this Earth for billions, with a B, billions of years. And that thousands upon thousands of ancient civilizations have existed in the pre-Adamic period that the Bible is talking about. All I'm asking is who are these pre-Adamic ancient civilizations that had high technology that we're only beginning to see and find in the oceans and find at the pyramids of Giza and all of these ancient temples around the world. Again, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We understand now the basis for that. We need to remember, too, at this point, it's important to remember there's a very big difference between an angel and the watchers. In the Bible, there's a certain creatures. The creatures are referred to in the Bible as the watchers. We're told that the watchers do only one thing. They watch you. Period. That's all they're to do is to watch and monitor you, your entire life. I'm assuming your very heartbeat. Everything is known about you. The watchers are watching us. They seem to be some kind of sentries from what the Bible indicates that are watching us and making sure that whoever and whatever is the ultimate authority in the universe knows about us every moment of the day. They're called the watchers. But... There is also those things which are called angels. And angels are not um, disembodied spirits. That's a different kind of an angel. There are certain angels the Bible implies, and other ancient uh, reference work imply, angels that were created spirit entities and have never been in human form. They were created as spirits, and they still are spirits. And yet there is also in the scriptures of many ancient peoples, including the Bible, the idea that there are disembodied spirits, humans which have died, but their spirits live on. So they're called disembodied spirits. So now you have disembodied spirits, humans who have died, but their spirit lives on. Then you have other spirits who have never been human. They were created spirits. And then you have the watchers, whoever they are, but they're watching us. And then you have something which I now want to talk about in the scriptures called the sons of God. 
the sons of God is a, no, a whole new subject. Genesis 1, it says, God who maketh his angels spirits. So the point I'm making here is that the particular words angels is, refer, is referring to entities which are pure spirit. <clears throat> but in Genesis 6, 1, we come across some very interesting scripture. In Genesis 6, 1, it says, And it came to pass, and listen to this, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the hell are you talking about? Men who began to multiply and children were born unto them? And where were the women at this time? I don't know how men could have children without women. All right. But then it goes on to say in chapter 6, 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. In all of the ancient scriptures of the world, not just the Bible, but in the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Rig Vita, all of the ancient scriptures in the, in the ancient East, uh, all of the ancient scriptures that we know of, all talk about the fact that there has been on this earth uh, alien life forms, Christianity and Judaism calls them angels, sons of God, I don't care what you call them, but all ancient scriptures talks about the fact that there were ancient civilizations that were cohabiting with us and, and our women and having sexual uh, connections with uh, human creatures. So, the scripture says in Genesis that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Here we see the sons of God are not angels and spirits. We're told that they were attracted to the daughters of men and um, took the women for wives. <clears throat> and another point, uh, going to Genesis 6, 4. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Well, the actual word translated and the Bible children is a Hebrew word that does not mean children. It means offspring of some kind. Well, yeah, if aliens are crossbreeding with humans, they're not going to be the normal kind of children. I don't know what they're going to be. They may be the reptium. But again, Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, these are the same who became mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Zechariah Sitchin talks about these mighty men of old who were the offspring of the gods with human women. In Genesis 18, an interesting story in Genesis 18 about the sons of God, these alien life forms who looked like us and said, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Well, in Genesis 18, we're reading, And the Lord said, a Lord appeared to Abraham. If you'll remember, Abraham and, uh, and Sarah were approached in the Bible story in Genesis 18 by three men who come walking up into their camp. I want to read just a quick part of this. In Genesis 18 in the Bible, Old Testament, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, and uh, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent in the heat of the day, Abraham did. And Abraham, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And he saw them, and he ran to meet them. And he said to them, My Lord, and let me wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And he ordered his wife to, start, to fix a dinner for the three men. And he set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree at the, as they did eat. So three men have come into Abraham's uh, area. And he sees them, the Bible says, and goes out and greets the three men, bows down on the ground and, and calls them his Lord. And asks them to please stay and have something to eat. 
<clears throat> we have pictures from the Bible where these unworldly guests, these, were three, these three are no ordinary men. Um, Abraham is confronted by three men that he recognizes to be his lords. And consequently, even uh, many, many different Bible translations have the pictures of Abraham and his wife feeding the three men that have come to visit him. But then it goes on to say in Genesis 18 that uh, two of the men got up after dinner and thanked him for dinner and it said, but the one stayed with him. Read the whole account in Genesis 18 and 19. Genesis 18, 19, the entire story is there, where the three men come walking up into the camp. They met uh, Abraham and his wife. Abraham asked them to sit down and have dinner. They did. Then after dinner, the two men got, got up and said, we really have to be going. We have a mission to do. They walked off. After thanking him for dinner, they walked off. But it says that the Lord, the Creator, Almighty God, the Creator, sat there and continued to talk with Abraham about personal things. God, the Creator, sat there after Abraham and his wife had fixed him dinner. Think about that. What is being said here? God, the Creator, has dropped by. You fix him a, a little lunch or something. <laughs> and he has two other accompanying gods with him. But since he is the God that you have chosen, he will stick around a little bit and hang out with you for a little bit. But the others have to go. They have other things to do. Okay? Now, what are the others going out to do? Well, go to chapter 19. And it said, and there came, <clears throat> chapter 19 says the two in chapter 18 who just had dinner and left, in chapter 19, it says, and so there came two angels to Sodom. Now we're talking about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the two angels that came in to Sodom and Gomorrah. But again, the word angel is a mistranslation in the English translation. It was actually sons of God. How do we know that? Well, we read on. And there came two angels to Sodom. And behold now, my lords. Well, I'll read it. it and there became two angels to Sodom at evening time. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he uh, bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray to you, into your servant's house and tarry overnight. So Lot was saying uh, to his lords, these, these uh, gods that he recognized, uh, you need to come in and stay with me in my home tonight. Why? Because this is a very vicious city. This is Sodom. This place is crawling with murderers and crawling with evil people. And so he made them a feast, and they did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So he brought them in, fed them again. And uh, where are the men which came in? Well, the homosexuals, we're told, surrounded, if you recall, in the Bible, chapter 19 of Genesis. The homosexuals thought these uh, two new guys that came into town were extraordinarily good-looking, handsome men and wanted to have sex with them. This is in the Bible, Genesis 18 and 19. And it says, and the angels then said to Lot, I mean, the homosexuals said to Lot, where are the men? that came into you. Where are they? Where are your guests? We know two guys have come in. We saw them. Where are they? And of course, if you remember the Bible story, uh, Lot uh, offers uh, to make some kind of a concession with the homosexuals and give them his daughters, but they're, they're, they're not interested in the women. They want the men. And, uh, and it says, I mean, this is Bible. This is Genesis 19. But the men, these angels, who were good-looking, handsome men, uh, said, uh, put forth their hand and pull Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then the men smote the men that were out at the door outside with blindness. And the men said unto Lot. So what happened in the Bible story is that the two angels are the two sons of God who had previously been with Abraham having lunch. Now we're having dinner with Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. They pulled him back in when he was trying to keep the homosexuals at bay, the, the angels came out 
the sons of God came out and said, Lot, come on back in the house. We'll take care of this. And it says that they, they struck the whole town with blindness so that they, that, the, that they run around, the people ran around town and they couldn't see anything. They were blind. All I'm saying is that in the case of the, of the angels or the sons of God who came into the daughters of men, or in Genesis 19 where the homosexuals see these men, a good-looking men, I could never imagine how some hideous creature from another world could talk a woman into bed. But I could imagine some good-looking, handsome man possibly doing so. So it, it makes sense to me that these uh, sons of God must have been very handsome and brilliant uh, men who were able to do supernatural things, who were able to capture the imagination of women and of, their, and of other men. And then here we're seeing that the homosexuals are, are now attacking these sons of God as good-looking men. The point I'm making is we've got alien visitors here, the gods who look like men. If I'm right, if there's anything to all of the ancient holy scriptures talking about the same thing, then what I'm saying is that they may still be here. We may have among us today what the ancient Hebrews call the sons of God, the Nephilim, the Rephirim, the ancient ones who look like us. The two men in Sodom are the same two men in that were with the Lord previous with Abraham. Now, in Hebrews, Hebrews uh, 13, this is New Testament now. This is not Old Testament. This is the Apostle Paul saying in the book of uh, Hebrews 13, 2. He said, let brotherly love continue, 13, 1. And be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Again, the word is not angels, it's sons of God. But the point is that, that uh, the Apostle Paul is saying, don't, be, don't forget to entertain people and men when you meet them. Don't be unkind to people. Always be courteous and kind to everyone. Because some have entertained sons of God unaware. Meaning that if there is, in fact, sons of God, which I am totally convinced there is, and if they are here with us, you never know. You might be sitting next to one and you don't know it. And if you're unkind to him, that may go bad with you later. So the idea was always be hospitable because you don't know who you're talking to. And I said to an audience one time in Beverly Hills when giving this presentation, I went out on a limb, decided to do it. I said, this very day, I am telling you, I am an angel. I am a son of God, and I have come here to give you a message. I wasn't, but I was just saying that. And I said, consequently, I might be just joking. And maybe I'm not really a son of God anyway. But you don't know for sure. All you know is I've told you I was. And if I'm wrong, there is no harm. But if I'm right, I'll see you when you die. And I'm going to be waiting for you on the other side. <laughs> right now, you have all the options. When you die, you're mine. And I'm waiting for you. So let's show a little respect. And it worked a little bit, I think, because they, don't, they weren't laughing. They were looking at me. That obviously, either this guy is mentally deranged or he's serious. In either case, don't mess with him. Right? So anyway, I'm just saying that this is Christian theology. In a book referred to as Heroes with Divine Blood, now we get into this Holy Blood, Holy Grail, Zachariah Sitchin, Lord, uh, Lord, what's his name? Gardner. Lawrence Gardner. The Holy Blood. Wow, what a, what a profound and pregnant subject that is. What are you talking about, Holy Blood? 
Well, this is what the kings of the world have always claimed, that they have a divine right to rule the human race. And I, for one, being an American, I reject anyone who says they have a divine right over me. As an American, there is no divine one over me, but the high one who rules in the heavens. No man, no Anunnaki, no God who will present himself to me do I bow my knee to ever. Period. You got a problem with that? But in this book, Heroes with Divine Blood, it says, Heroic figures may owe their superhuman powers to some divine connection, descent from or help from a deity which endows them with strength and tenacity. Alternatively, they may have magic weapons or gain powers by obtaining, by gifts or stealing or merit, some divine secret. It may be the ability to speak with or take the form of animals. Nevertheless, their wisdom may give them the role of teacher or lawgiver, bringing to mankind the rulers of society and the arts and skills of civilization. In this function, they may appear as ancestors, founders, of a society and ideal rulers or priests, heroes with the divine blood. This is what the kings and rulers, as I said, have always claimed, that they should be the king and queen of the British Empire. They have a divine right. Nothing is more reprehensible to me as a human than somebody who tells me they have a divine right over me. There ain't nobody had a divine right over me over me, including my own mother. Nobody has a divine right over me. Heroes with the divine blood, the holy blood, holy grail, Bajent Lee and Lincoln, uh, on all of these different new books which are coming out talking about this uh, hidden agenda of secret societies who present themselves to the world as our masters because they have some kind of a secret alliance with a divine bloodline to rule us. And I'm saying to my friends and my fellow countrymen in America, you had better wake up and find out there is no such a thing as a divine right to rule over us. We were created free moral agents. And the only way they can take from you your freedom is if you give it to them in a contract. You give them your freedom by acquiescing to their power. I don't care if they're mafia. I don't care if they're Nazis. I don't care if they're strong arm for the mob. You still give in. I have no intentions of giving in to any tyrant, any murderer, any bloodshed murderer who calls himself a divine uh, right to rule. There is no such a thing. I think we better go back and look I think we're talking about the sons of God, and I think there are good ones and bad ones. Right now, we've got bad ones ruling us. The divine right of kings, heroes with divine blood. Nothing is more reprehensible to me. Consequently, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6 to Christians, and unfortunately, Christians have forgotten this admonishment from the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 6, 12 says, for we, meaning Christians, but all mankind, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against ordinary people. We're not wrestling against ordinary, our brothers and sisters, but we are wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word in Greek is cosmocratorus. Cosmocratorus in Greek means rulers of world darkness. Cosmocratorus, rulers of world darkness, implying that the entire world is ignorant, ill-informed, and stumbling around in the dark 
but that there are entities on this earth who are our, who are our masters, who are manipulating our ignorance and stupidity and darkness. They are the cosmocraterists of Greeks. They are the ones that Christians are told to be aware of, to be aware of and to stand against in these last days. And make no mistake about it, it is my belief that we are living in the last and final days of an old order of civilization on the earth and what is coming on this earth is going to be god awful if mankind doesn't get back their own spirituality and say no more will we bow to nazis and fascists and murderers who seek to imprison us on this earth we were created free like the animals we were born free and we will damn so damn well stay free or die in the process because as Hiram Mann the first governor of California said in a great quote no man is free when freedom fails the best men rot in filthy jails while those who cried appease appease are hung by those they tried to please there can be no common cause with tyranny there can be no substitution for your spirituality, connecting yourself with the divine principle of freedom and love in the universe, and don't ever bow your knee to the cosmocraterists or those who might very well be working behind the scenes to destroy a great creation called the human race. Thank you.